an alternative to the Ten Commandments, a survival guide for humanity. The first part of this video will deal with the commandments themselves, and the second part deals with my proposed alternatives. According to the Bible, the Ten Commandments were dictated by God to Moses on Mount Sinai a few thousand years ago. Whether this really happened or not is not important for the purposes of this video. The Ten Commandments are a set of orders or rules, the apparent purpose of which is to control human behaviour, which implies that the author or authors thought that human behaviour needs to be controlled. This is a very tricky subject to try to figure out morally. If you allow greater freedom of thought and expression, there will be some who use this to their advantage by exploiting others. Their actions will increase overall human sufferings. But if you restrict human freedom, you are likely to stultify creativity and could end up with a totalitarian state or a theocratic nightmare. Some of the Ten Commandments make more sense than others. Let's see where we get to if my own moral perspective is applied to them. Number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This only makes sense if God is real and considers himself more important than other gods and also feels that he needs the attention. Number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. I really don't see what difference this makes. If anyone feels the need to carve a likeness of someone or something, and then worship it, in the privacy of their own home, so what? However, if they then try to coerce others into worshipping it, I would say that's not a great road to go down. Number three. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Well, if he actually exists, and is offended so easily, maybe out of niceness, we ought to cut down on the goddams and holy shits. Number four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Firstly, there is disagreement among Christians as to whether the Sabbath is on a Saturday or Sunday. Secondly, the calendar we use today has been adjusted many times over the centuries, particularly during the Middle Ages. So the seven-day week we have today could almost certainly not be traced back to biblical times as an unbroken sequence of days. The seven-day week does not fit exactly into a 365.2422 day long year. The daily spin of the Earth does not fit exactly into the period of its yearly orbit around the Sun. Number five. Honour thy father and mother. I can understand being respectful to one's parents if they are not complete scumbags. The idea of being ordered to honour them seems a bit phony, though. Number six, thou shalt not kill. I'm with God on this one. Unless you happen to be in the horrible situation of having to kill someone to save your own life or the life of a loved one. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Speaking as someone who is married, I agree with this. Number eight, Thou shalt not steal. If only life were that simple. In principle, I strongly agree with this, but I can imagine a situation where, for example, someone feels forced to steal in order to feed their family, if they have no other way of doing so. Number nine. Thou shalt not bear false witness. No major qualms with this one. Number ten. Thou shalt not covet. This is a very tricky one. It's in our nature to covet things and the attention of people we find attractive. We can't simply turn our desires off. Now the thing about the commandments, whether they were divinely or humanly inspired, is that they are very restrictive. It amazes me how often you hear people citing them as the pinnacle of morality, even now in the 21st century. So while they seem on one level to be archaic and primitive, especially the first four and the tenth, we need to take the fact that they exist and are adhered to seriously. As you've probably gathered by now, I'm not a big fan of rules dictated from on high. I have an alternative proposal, but it isn't a set of rules or commandments. 
It's more like ten suggestions, recommendations, ideas perhaps, things to think about. Number one. Promote scientific literacy and curiosity-driven research. I don't just mean in terms of formal education. Anyone can pick up a book, watch a documentary, or look up on the internet something they want to find out about. I think the spark of curiosity is something to be encouraged in everyone. And it can be contagious. The more you find out about how the world works and how things really are, the more you want to learn. Number two. Correct factual errors. Politely, of course. Nowhere is there more confusion than here on the internet. Pseudoscientists, religious extremists and conspiracy theorists are incredibly popular, especially here on YouTube. Many researchers, as they often like to be known, come up with some pretty amazing stuff. But all too often, it becomes tarnished by paranoia, gullibility and ignorance. I'm not suggesting for a second that I have the answers or the ultimate truth. The thing that is so important is that unless we know something for absolute certain, we must not claim to be certain about it. So, for example, when we watch a YouTube video which claims that the lack of stars in the background of photos taken on the moon is proof that humans never went there, you can simply comment that no camera adjusted to take photos in sunlight will record a single star if pointed at a clear night sky. The difference in brightness is too great to capture both in a single photo. Number three. Recognize dogma for what it is and encourage open dialogue. Any religion, belief system or individual that discourages inquiry into differing viewpoints should set the alarm bells ringing. This is where science is so different from religion. We need to be able to freely talk about what is interesting and important, free from censorship and taboos. Number four, reduce the consumption of fossil fuels. Whether global warming is man-made or not, the simple fact is that we are burning carbon, which we find mainly within the Earth's crust, for our energy demands converting it from solid matter into carbon dioxide gas. We are altering the composition of our atmosphere. Nature stored the carbon over millions of years, and we are releasing it within a few hundred. Surely it's obvious that human behaviour is causing an imbalance. Number five. Plant more trees. Allowing trees to grow is the quickest and easiest way to capture carbon dioxide from the air and turn it into something solid. Forest cover also helps to regulate the water cycle, gives food and shelter to our animal cousins and provides us with somewhere nice to walk our dogs. Number six. Try to be more efficient with the consumption of all resources. Very simply put, Increasing consumption of non-renewable but useful materials can't go on forever. If we care at all about our descendants, then we should try to leave something more than a plundered wasteland for them. Using low-energy light bulbs, hybrid or electric cars, and insulation in our houses all play a part, but we really need to think carefully about the long-term sustainability of our comfortable lifestyles. Number seven. Focus more on sustainable energy sources such as solar, wind and wave power. While we have such a high demand for energy to power our 21st century existence, we should try to generate this energy as efficiently as we can. Number eight, cut down on the amount of meat we eat. Apart from the fact that killing our animal cousins in order to eat them makes some of us feel uncomfortable, it takes far more land and water to produce meat than it does to produce grain, vegetables and fruit. And with a global population of nearly 7 billion to feed, we don't have unlimited land available to turn into new farms. Number 9. Improve upon capitalism without compromising democracy, equality or individual freedom. This is where I am least qualified to suggest solutions but I can see that our Western society has some huge problems to overcome and a huge responsibility to those less well-off than ourselves. 
Capitalism can be incredibly cruel, especially in the cutthroat world of big business. But apart from education and a few tweaks here and there, I'm not sure how we can change it for the better. Number 10. Seriously think about and discuss human overpopulation. This is one of the least talked about but most important issues humanity is facing and almost every other problem we face as a species is connected in some way. We make huge demands on this planet already but as our numbers grow and as more nations develop what we think of as a higher standard of living the toll on finite resources will only increase. One of the decisions we can make is to have fewer children. In the future the global human population will decline. Surely it would be better for us to see this coming and do something about it rather than have nature make the decision for us. The chances are that most of the people who have more than two children will never see this or similar messages. My hope is that this subject will be discussed an awful lot more in the near future. Of course, trying to single out the ten best ways to improve our global situation is not easy, and there will be many who disagree and have different priorities. I'm concerned that we are rapidly heading towards a terrible catastrophe. If we run out of clean water, food or breathable air, we are seriously screwed. So, despite the fact that there are hundreds, if not thousands of different languages, thousands of dogmatic belief systems, we, as a species, really need to focus our efforts on sorting out the mess we find ourselves in. The first and most important thing is to recognise and understand that we are in a mess. Day to day, it might not seem so, particularly for the young, but on a longer time scale, it doesn't take a genius to see that the earth cannot indefinitely support human life and society as we know it.